have the joy of introducing our, our preacher today, and uh, Gary Thomas writes books, he preaches, he travels, he speaks, and I've got a number of friends that are pastors and writers, but a very small circle of friends that when I have needs in my life, when I'm walking through things, I can call them anytime. I know if they're not in the meeting or something really important, they're going to answer the phone. Gary's one of those people. And he prays for Sherry. He and his wife uh, pray for Sherry and I. And we, we love them and they love us. And so we're just thankful for their relationship. And so a while back, Gary was working on this new concept for a book. And he called me and he was talking to me about it. And he said, it's a challenging topic and it's kind of complicated. And if people misunderstand it, they could kind of come after the person who writes the book. It happens sometimes in our world. And so he shared the concept and I just said, oh, I'm glad you're writing it and not me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, and then after the book was finished, he sent the manuscript and I, read, and I had a chance to read it. It was, it was brilliant and it's just, it, it hits this critical need in the church that almost nobody wants to touch. And then he said, could you and Sherry write the small group study guide that goes with this so then if the bullets start flying, they'll fly at you guys too. <laughs> and so I said, yes. yes. And, we, and so we're kind of in this together. But, but um, the topic that Gary's going to preach on today is critically important. It's very complex. So to take 30 minutes and to introduce something, to preach biblically on it, and to call people to action is a challenging thing. So I'm going to ask you to, to pray with me. That God, and we're the, we are the first church that Gary is preaching this at. The book comes out in a day or two from now. And so, and I said to him, this is a warm, loving church that will receive this, and we're going to get input and share it with him as he goes other places and brings this message. And so will you join me in praying not only for this message, but also for Gary as he brings this message to the church. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for Gary and Lisa, for their three children, for their granddaughter, uh, for, the, for the gift of life that you've given to them and the calling on their lives in ministry. And we pray, we pray that as Gary preaches your word this day, you'd open our hearts and prepare us to receive a challenging, complicated, but deeply needed message. Fill him with your spirit. Empower him. Use him right now here at Shoreline in this room and the family worship venue online. But we pray you'd use him in the months and years to come, bringing this message to other churches around the world. So bless him, fill him, and use him right now. Prepare our hearts to receive. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Will you welcome Gary Thomas? My wife may be one of the world's healthiest eaters. That's the blessing and the burden that I live with. And as part of that, she believes that pretty much everybody can benefit from what they call an elimination diet where they give you blood tests and you don't eat the foods that might be potentially making you sick or sapping your energy. When I went through the tests, I found out that for three weeks, I basically couldn't eat anything I liked to eat. But I knew I was never going to have any peace, so I had to go through with it. And it immediately had problems. I had a long run coming up on a Saturday. There's literally nothing on the list that I felt I could eat before the run. And he said, well, you know, carrots actually have a lot of carbohydrates. I'm like, honey, I cannot run 13 miles on a carrot. But the worst thing was over my birthday, it was abysmal timing. I had my birthday in the midst of this, and there's only two times of year I eat cake and ice cream. I love cake and ice cream. Because of the calories, I just can't do it. So, I, I mean, for me, to be honest, it is God, family, cake and ice cream, and you all. All right? So that, that's sort of... <laughs> and, and, and so... During my birthday, this woman invited us over for dinner, and she didn't know I'm on this elimination diet. She cooked, baked this great cake and had ice cream. I had to watch five other people eat my cake and ice cream while I'm sitting there sniffing it, right? <laughs> that night, I was so frustrated. I'm kind of taken out on Lisa. I was like, I said, I am so going to splurge when this is over. You have no idea. Lisa says, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean? She goes, it takes weeks, if not months, to come off an elimination diet. So nobody told me that. Like, like, what do you mean? She goes like, well, the first day, you, you tested for cranberries. So the first day, we'll give you some cranberries and see how your body reacts. I don't even like cranberries, all right? I, I eat cranberries at Thanksgiving to be polite. I could go the rest of my life without eating another cranberry. I said, what doctor from hell thought up this diet? <laughs> But the thinking is that there are these foods, they deplete your energy and they make you sick. And if you remove these foods from your diet, you just have a more vibrant life. You have more energy, more zest to engage with others. What if the same thing is true with our relationships? That there are people that make us sick. 
that deplete us from our energy, that undercut who we are so that we can't give ourselves more fully to healthy relationships. And maybe out of misplaced guilt, we let even family members, coworkers, neighbors slowly make us sick, the toxic people, just like there are toxic foods. Is that possible? Well, I want us to begin with a mind change. Romans 12, 2 says we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. We used this yesterday. So we have to think about it differently. And here's the mind change. Being holy isn't just about not doing sinful things. It's about being set apart for glorious, eternal things. And here how, here's how Jesus sets that up. In, in Luke 10, 2, he tells us to pray for more workers. He said that an important work is being launched. We don't have enough people. And so he tells those who do follow him in, Luke, in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. The notion is to be a people of Jesus, is to be people who wake up and think, Lord, what do you want to do? To, how do you want to use me? How do I give myself to your work? It's not about my pleasure. It's not about my financial advancement. It's not about what I need. My agenda today is really your agenda. What is it that you want me to do? And then Jesus says this outright in John 15, 8. And if you'll read this verse with me, I, I want it to be fresh in our minds. Jesus said this, my father read with me, is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. It's clear that to Jesus, fruitfulness matters. The Christian life, the victorious Christian life, is a life that bears fruit. Unfortunately, I think we live in a day and age of the church where faithfulness is defined by piety, i.e. avoiding sinful actions, more than it's defined by fruitfulness, which is doing good works. But if we value fruitfulness as much as Jesus does and producing as much as Jesus does, we'll recognize that just why healthy people want to avoid toxic foods, spiritually vibrant people want to avoid toxic people. It's not that we don't want to be bothered. As a Christian, I live to be bothered. Every day I'm waking up, Lord, if there's a divine appointment, if there's someone I can share my faith with, if there's someone I can encourage, I want to be used by you. It's about wanting to be more effective, valuing the time that God gives us so we can be more strategic. Because here's the thing. Satan is aware of our passion for God's kingdom. He knows he can't stop us from loving and caring others for others because God's spirit within us makes us care. We receive God's love and grace. We want to pass it on. We're excited about it. Satan knows he can't stop that. And if we were to view that pure love of God that flows through us as this pure water, that if it glows, goes through us, it can pour out onto fields and creates an abundant crop same things. I, I, I can't stop that, but here's what I can do. I can redirect that water straight into the gutter of toxic people who not only won't ever produce fruit, but they'll be resentful and try to stop any more water from flowing. So here's how we avoid that. First, let's remember again, we were saved for a mission. If we repeat Matthew 6, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. And I want to stress, Jesus didn't write this for people like Kevin and me who are paid to be Christians. <laughs> he didn't. He was speaking to farmers and tradesmen, to mothers and fathers, to grandparents, and to young children and teenagers. Everyone, he says, to be a part of my faith is to seek first my kingdom. We all value the kingdom just as much. And then after he rises from the dead, he expresses to us one of the parts of that kingdom work. And that is this, in the Great Commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now the early church took this seriously and the apostle Paul essentially repeats both the Sermon on the Mount and the Great Commission. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 5.15. I find this fascinating. The Sermon on the Mount is this. Christ died for all. Why? So that we go to heaven? Not just that. He says, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. 
So Paul has the same sense of Jesus. To be in the faith, we don't live for ourselves. We don't live for our own advancement. We live for him. And then how do we express that? This is Paul's great commission, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It says Timothy 2.2, 2. it should be 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the, th- oh, boy, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, if you want to really have a voice warm up, there you go. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people, other translations say faithful, who will be qualified to teach others. So both Jesus and Paul say we wake up with God's agenda on our mind and we express that by finding reliable people that we invest in. So Christianity, Jesus and Paul both agree the focus of Christianity isn't on not doing bad things. The focus is on investing in good people. It's an endless, persistent pursuit of taking everything that God has given us and saying, who can I give that to? Who can I invest in? So by extension, that's why we know we're not called to be the heroes who break through to toxic people. We're not called to be the ones who waste 15 years with someone that is never going to change or pass on what God has given us to say. Now, I keep using the phrase toxic, so you might say, what what does toxic mean? And it's tough because it takes me three chapters in the book to define it, and I can't do that in a 30-minute sermon unless Kevin wants to give me another couple hours. I'm guessing no. Yeah, so so here's the thing. Toxic people are not difficult people, and I'm not talking about sinners per se. We are called to share our faith freely with sinners. There's a difference. All toxic people are difficult, but not all difficult people are toxic. How do we know the difference? You can't interact with toxic people without being a little bit destroyed. You get that feeling? You you interact and, and you just feel a little bit destroyed. Here's sort of a general description. Toxic people are ruled by selfishness and spite. They're draining instead of encouraging. They use people instead of love them. They love self-righteous rash judgment. And so they're always fighting with people instead of enjoying and appreciating people. They may be jealous of healthy people's peace, family, and friendships. And spend much of their time and effort trying to bring people down to their level of misery. Rather than blessing others with joy and encouragement. This is so key. They often want to control you, and you feel that. And it may feel as they just basically want you to stop being you. They're the people that demean us, that distract us, that deplete us. They keep us awake. They steal our joy, assault our peace. They even assault our sanity. They are masters at gaslighting. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them are masters at gaslighting. Gaslighting is when someone makes you feel crazy for stating what is clearly true. You're calling them out and they make you feel like you have lost your mind when you know you're speaking the truth. So you lose all sense of confidence. You lose all sense of security, even what is true. In general, if someone is getting in the way of you becoming the person God created you to be, or doing the work that you know God has created you to do, for you, that person is toxic. Here's an example. I loved my college years, some of the best years of my life, and that I just got rooted in the faith, uh, had passion for God's kingdom, ended up getting engaged and marrying my wife at the time. They were such valuable years. So it's particularly painful to read, well, actually I talked with her, a woman who basically her first year of college was stolen by a toxic sweet mate that the college had assigned to her. She had a roommate that she picked out and the school assigned a third woman. Her name is Andrea. The, the, the roommate was called Samantha. And Andrea was just shocked to find that Samantha pretty much had to have a beef with someone to get out of bed and to feel alive. It was something someone had done or something someone had not done. And, some, and Andrea could never please her. If she went out to dinner without checking or something, it was just huge offense. It would be an hour working through it. She would move Andrea's things without it. I mean, it was just crazy what she would do. And then she would storm off and, and go to the neighbor's house where they had thin walls and tell the neighbors how awful Andrea was. And, and, and Andrea was amazed because she realized that Samantha had had more conflict in the first two months of college than she had had in the first two decades of her life. And she went to the RA who didn't have any filter on what a toxic person could be. And this is just 
Two people, you need to get a, learn how to live together. It's all part of the college experience. You just got to forgive. You just got to understand. But Andrea's mom was a little more experienced, and she saw what was happening to her daughter. Andrea's skin was breaking out. She had no energy. She was so terrified to go back to her suite that she would stay out late until she thought Samantha was asleep and she'd get up early before Samantha would be awake. So she had no energy for her classes. She wasn't meeting new friends until her mom finally stepped in and said, Andrea, this, this is not healthy. You've got to get out of there. She went over the head of the RA. They got her out of there. So the roommate put all of her focus then on the other roommate. She was out of there by Christmas. The school assigned a third roommate who was out of there by Easter. Holidays were very unkind to Samantha. But it was an institution that didn't get that sometimes it's not about learning to get along. Sometimes for somebody's health, they have to learn when to walk away. Now, I'll be honest. I'm glad I wasn't trying to counsel Andrea 30 years ago. I didn't have toxic people in my vocabulary. If I ran up against someone like that, I would assume I'm just blowing it. Somehow I'm not surrendering to God. I'm not walking in obedience. I'm not understanding scripture. I'm not acting lovingly. I would be like the person, if, if you compare a toxic person to somebody with has horrendous breath, you know, they've just had leeks and garlic and onion and gas station sushi, right? And, then, and, and they're burping it up at you. And I would be saying, oh, God, please heal my nose. There, there must be something wrong with my nose. I don't want to think this person stinks. It's a sin for me to think this person say, please just heal my nose. And God would say, Gary, there is nothing wrong with your nose. Your nose works well. That person's breath stinks. You need to walk away. I'm, I'm trying to protect you. But I would have always thought that that was a failure. In fact, I would have thought, it sounds so unchristian. How can't Christians just get along? But is it unchristian if Jesus says the same thing conceptually? It's fascinating. We're talking less than 10 verses after he tells us to seek first his kingdom. He tells us, in the midst of seeking my kingdom, there's somebody I want you to watch out for. Maybe you've been familiar with Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Jesus says this, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. You can't make this sound polite. Jews didn't have dogs as pets. He's not talking about Lassie. Romans, Egyptians had dogs as pets. Jew, dogs in Jewish quarters, they're mongrels. They were nasty. They were just scavenging. I mean, it was awful. And then he's calling somebody swine in a Jewish context. And he's saying, you can give them a pearl of great price. Remember, pearls were so valuable. One man sold all he had for a single pearl. This is so valuable. It's so good. It's so rich. And you could present it in the most grace-filled, loving, gentle, and relevant way. And this person will not only not receive it, they will resent you. They will hate you for it. And they will turn and tear you to pieces. So in the context, Jesus said, we don't have enough workers. I want you to be busy about the work, but I want you to be effective in your work. So I'm warning you away from those kind of people that will stop your future work because they're so toxic. They, they throw you, tear you apart. Now, and I found Matthew 7, 6 is sort of a Rorschach test for active Christians. If you believe Christianity is primarily about being nice, Jesus sounds mean and hurtful, and you think, how could he say that? If you think Christianity is about producing fruit, it's gold. Thank you, Jesus. You want me to serve you? You don't want me torn up. You don't want me to lose my sanity in serving you. You're saying, be focused, because these are the people that are going to oppose you. See, in assuming an active life of mission, I think in one sense, Jesus are, is calling us battlefield surgeons. In World War II, when they stormed the beaches of Normandy, they had a cadre of surgeons that followed the soldiers, and they had to perform what they called triage. They would come up to a soldier that was injured, and they would have to determine how likely is this person to survive. And they might come up to a soldier that almost certainly was going to die. If they spent 90 minutes still and 95 chances he's going to die, what they would do is they'd shoot him up with morphine, paint an M on his chest so that nobody else gave him another dose because that would be fatal. And then they went to find the others who could still be saved. 
It's not that they were harsh toward the very fatally injured soldiers. You say, realize, if I spend 90 minutes on a hopeless case, 12 other people will die that could be saved. And Jesus is saying, find those that God is working on that can be saved and don't waste your time on the toxic people that will just resent it. Jesus modeled this. Remember his conversation with the rich young ruler? Man comes up to him. Jesus discerns his heart. He was filled with the love of money. And he says, look, if you really want to be perfect, here's what you do. You sell everything you have. You give it to the poor. And then you come and follow me. And what would we give to follow Jesus? But the Bible says he went away very sad because he was very rich. See, our world doesn't think you're very sad when you're very rich. But in that case, it was. Notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't chase after him. He didn't say, oh, yo, 100%, that's a little aggressive. Look, uh, I've read the art of the deal. Let's go 50%, all right? We'll, we'll, we'll disciple you up. We'll, we'll try. No, Jesus turned to his disciples, the reliable people, and he said, let me explain to you why it's so difficult for the rich to receive the kingdom of God. There's another instance, and this one breaks my heart. It's in Matthew chapter 8. Two men filled with demons are delivered by Jesus. The demons ask to go into a herd of pigs. Jesus says, fine. The pigs run over the cliff, and the people are appalled. They've watched their livelihood just die in front of them, right? I mean, they can have a fire cell on pork chops and bacon, but a week from now, the economy doesn't look so good. And I just pause here, because you're here early on a Sunday morning in a beautiful part of the world. And I just ask, what would you pay for a weekend with Jesus? To hear him, to ask him questions, to watch what he does with people. They had that. But he was challenging how they were making their money. And what did they say? Matthew chapter 8 verse 34. They pleaded with Jesus to leave their region. They said, Jesus, just go. What did Jesus do? The very next verse. It's confusing because it's a different chapter. It's the very next verse. Matthew 9.1 Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. They said, leave. Jesus said, okay. Didn't explain what he did. He didn't try to reconvince. He just said, if you're closed, I'm gone. In fact, to go through this, I counted 41 citations in the four gospels. 41 times where Jesus walked away from somebody or let somebody walk away from him without that person agreeing with Jesus or without that person being changed. Now, because of the synoptic gospels, some of those events are the same ones, but that still leaves over two dozen incidents where Jesus' interaction with somebody didn't lead to change, and Jesus walked away or let them walk away. Walk away. I used to think that was a failure. I used to think I've got to double down, maybe to prove my own faith, maybe to prove my own ministry ability, and then I realized, well, Jesus didn't fail. Maybe I'm looking at ministry entirely the wrong way because Jesus told his disciples to do what he did Matthew 10 14 if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words keep talking keep letting them ridicule you keep letting them make you think you've gone crazy eventually they're going to come around no what does he say shake the dust off your feet when you leave that town Jesus taught and modeled that many times in a life of fruitfulness, it's appropriate to walk away. Here's what I want to say. God isn't honored when you let yourself be emotionally and spiritually and certain, certainly physically ripped to shreds. Because you're most valuable to his work when you live a life of vibrancy and confidence. And you have peace and joy and it just gushes out of you. And you want to share it if somebody is undercutting your peace, undercutting your joy, making you feel like you have nothing to give. You won't lose your faith, but you won't be able to pass on your faith. The Puritans were aware of this. A 17th century Puritan named William Grinnell wrote this massive book called The Christian and Complete Armor. And he warned of this. He said, it is easier to keep flies out of your pantry in the summer than to keep Satan's servants from stealing your joy and infecting your peace. Now, before you had closed doors and air conditioning, all that, that, I mean, that was a much bigger issue. And what he's saying is they can't steal your foundation, but they're going after your joy. You're going after your peace. 
And again, I would have read that probably 20 years ago. That just sounds selfish. Why should I care if somebody steals my joy? But remember the scripture, the joy of the Lord is our. See, toxic people want to make you weak. If you're weak, they win. If you're weak, we're not fruitful. Certain foods may not put me in the hospital. I'm not going to close up my esophagus. My head isn't going to explode. But they just drain me. They just make me weak. What if it's the same with people? I just want to ask, how sick does someone have to make you before you're willing to walk away? How much do you have to let them destroy your spiritual health before you decide, yeah, maybe this person is toxic? This is about valuing your call and valuing your ministry. Because toxic people won't. One young woman had to learn this in a very difficult way because it was a family member who was toxic. Her name is Esther Fleece. She grew up in a dysfunctional home. It was chaos. Her parents were always at conflict with each other and her dad was always at conflict with people outside of his house. He would drag his young daughter into court as a character witness before she was a teenager. And she tried to survive by pouring her heart and mind into this journal that she kept hidden. And it was just, I don't understand what's going on, trying to gain sanity, trying to get some sense of order in a crazy world. And that sort of kept her alive, just pouring her heart into this journal. And then when she was about 12 years old, there was a custody case where her mother or her father would get to keep her. Her mom and her dad were arguing. She was put up on the stand in a courtroom And she said, the last thing when you come from an abusive home that you want to do is talk about your abusive home. And we won't get this if you don't come from it. It feels shameful. She had nothing to do with it, but she was ashamed and she didn't want to talk about it in public. But then one of the worst moments of her life came when her father's lawyer stood up with a clear plastic baggie to enter evidence. Inside the baggie was Esther's journal. And she couldn't believe it. It was an act of sacrilege, sir. That's what kept her sane. And how had he found it? And somebody had read it. And the lawyer wanted to read from it in public to show how awful her mom was. Esther collapsed on the spot, just sobbing. And she cried out, I will never write another word again. And it was so painful because writing is what kept her sane. And now that had been taken away from her as well. The judge was so heartless. He said, Esther, you've got to suck it up. He literally said that. You don't have to give long answers, but you have to say yes or no. We have to get through this. Eventually, the court decided neither the mother nor the father could care for her. Thank God for a wonderful local church that brought Esther in. They said she's not going into the foster system. She was adopted by a family who nurtured her faith. And as often happens, God used her experiences to launch a powerful ministry. She became one of the leading young women uh, millennials. She was used by Focus on the Family. She was featured in Time Magazine, CNN, USA Today. Just powerful ministry. It's, it's, It's what God does. But toxic people don't like to let go. Her dad read about what she was doing. Esther, because she had her own paycheck now, had set up an apartment that was just a sanctuary for her. She'd have Bible verses where she wanted. People came and they had dinners together and it felt safe. And again, when you come from a dysfunctional home, you you take it, you you may not realize how safe it feels to come home. Home was always a place of terror for her. Home was always where she felt most threatened. But now she had this sanctuary, this refuge. But her dad found out where she lived. And now she was being stalked. And now home was again a place of terror. And she didn't know what to do. And fortunately, the church gave her better advice than I would have. He said, Lord... Lester, you've got to get a restraining order. And at first she resisted. How does a daughter put a restraining order on her dad? And when he broke it, as the church knew he would, he got sent to jail. And Esther told me, I thought, I must have failed as a daughter. What kind of a daughter puts her father in jail? And I would say, Esther, a beloved 
servant in God's kingdom who knows she is called, who knows she has a particular ministry, who is protecting that ministry and is doing the right thing, even if it's a family member. A book that Esther wrote, and this is what I love about being a Christian and some of you here are brought in and, and you don't know where you are with the Lord and you, you hear us singing songs about Jesus and you say, seriously, w what's the deal? And, and I get that, it might seem funny, but here's why we fall in love with Jesus again and again and why we give our lives to him because we see what he did to Esther. We see him do it all over the world. He takes people in their greatest hurt, in their greatest brokenness, and not only do they survive, they thrive, and they end up ruling. And that's what happened with Esther. Remember the young girl who said in the courtroom, I will never write another word again? Remember that girl? Thankfully, God healed her, and she did write an incredible book called No More Faking Fine. It's a book on using the power of lament to find spiritual healing. The book was presented at the Country Music Hall of Fame. And I was there when they were presenting the book for the first time. We had a fancy dinner. It was closed off. The museum was closed. Uh, in the rotunda where they put the plaques of all the great country stars of all time. And Esther introduced it brilliantly. She pointed out at these plaques and she said, how many songs of lament were produced in this museum? And everybody laughed because that's what country music is, right? I lost my dog, I lost my wife, I lost my truck. I mean, that, that's pretty much what they sing about. And we all laugh like you did. And then, again, prophetically, she said, how many books on lament do you find in a Christian bookstore? We're like, oh, God had used this woman from the dysfunctional home, brought her to healing, and now she was helping the church be healed. That's what God does. That's why we worship him, and that's what Esther needed to do. Here's the deal. God has a plan for your life, and it is a beautiful plan. It will be what God created you to be, and when you're walking in God's will, it's like wearing a perfect coat that you never want to take off. It's just who you are. You know it. It's perfect. He has a plan. Toxic people will come into your life and they have a plan. They want you to do what they want you to do. They don't want you to do what they don't want you to do. The reason we walk away is we realize God's plan is best. You get one life. A hundred times out of a hundred, choose God's plan. And to know that walking in God's plan means following in the footsteps of Jesus, which sometimes means learning when to walk away. Let's pray. Father, your son lived the most obedient, the most perfect, the most loving, the most glorious life that has ever been lived. We worship him because he is worthy of being worshiped. May we now follow him. May we wrestle with these scriptures. May we be delivered from false guilt that keeps us in relationships that make us sick, that steal our joy and peace, undercut our self-confidence so that we're not helping anybody. We're not reaching out to anybody. We're just trying to survive. Lord, I believe your word is a light but I also believe your spirit can take this light and right now awaken in people's minds and hearts toxic relationships that you are saying this is your key for freedom. You can walk away. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we thank Gary? So I've, as a pastor... I've walked with lots of difficult people. That's part of being a minister. And people have walked with me when I've been difficult. That's part of life. But I've also walked with a handful of toxic people. Not a lot, but a handful. And in every case, when I finally was wise enough to write, you know, to draw a line, to walk away, to create a barrier, they never thanked me for all the time and love and care I gave. They just attacked me even more. It's a tough journey. Difficult people we learn to walk with in love. Toxic people we draw the lines. And so I want to encourage you, uh, if, if this has spoken to your heart or you want to go deeper into this topic, like I said, I got to read the manuscript of this book before it was officially a book, and it was powerful. It re reinforced things and gave me more guidance. Uh, right now, the book's not out yet. This is an advanced copy, but you got a, a card in your bulletin. If this speaks to your heart, buy a copy using this card, and they'll send you two copies. 
what'll happen is you get two for the price of one and you can read it. And when you're reading it, I know what's gonna happen. You're gonna go, oh my gosh, I know someone who needs this. And you'll have an extra copy to give to that person. Also, if you weren't here yesterday, Gary spoke on marriage. And if you weren't able to be here, you missed an amazing time of learning. But Gary has two books on marriage that we have available. This isn't here because it's not out yet. These two, we still have some copies in the, in the bookstore, in the, in the Connection Center. So you can get one of those on your way out if that would be helpful for you. Just a few words before I send you out with a blessing. Uh, first of all, Sherry and I, every so often, we'll just go in the Connection Center, right through the lobby, past the connection, uh, into the Connection Center, and we'll be right there. If you're new at Shoreline and you've never had a chance to meet us, we'd love to meet you, say hello, pray with you, and just greet you. And so come by the Connection Center, and we'd love to spend a couple minutes with you and meet you. Uh, also, if you have never been baptized, I want to encourage you to consider being baptized. We have a class coming up today, right when I say amen and finish our time. Uh, you can go to that class and learn more. And, that, and that's just past the Connection Center in the Peninsula Room and uh, learn about baptism. And if, you've, if you're a new believer and you need to get baptized, especially tonight, last Sunday morning, get, get ready to rejoice in this, 15 people who didn't know Jesus became followers of Jesus Christ last Sunday morning. Yeah, praise God. Um, and, and, and they're now taking steps of growth, and one of those steps is baptism. So if you've never been baptized, go to that class. It's a short little class that Pastor Roy leads, but you'll learn the meaning of baptism and our next baptism time. And then also, if you need prayer for anything, for yourself or someone you love, come forward for prayer. We have teams ready to pray. And if you have like a big challenge, a big spiritual challenge for you or a big spiritual challenge for someone you love, the team under the cross over here is ready, if you request it, to lay hands on you, to anoint you with oil, and to pray a special prayer for God's deliverance and power and healing. They're ready to do that if you need that. If you have questions about Shoreline, go to the Connection Center. They love to answer questions about anything about how to connect, be part of the church. And if you're brand new at Shoreline and you've never gone there, go by the Connection Center. They want to give you a gift. And thank you for coming and answer your questions. And so be sure you go by and say hello to them. As I send you off from here, would you stand with me if you're able to stand just for a moment and let me bless you before you head out of here. As you go from this place, you're gonna bump into difficult people. Walk with them, love them, care for them. And when you're the difficult person, love yourself and pray for power to change. And when you bump into toxic people who steal what God wants to do in you and through you, and who stomp on your heart and your soul. Follow Jesus and walk away in his name and go be fruitful for Jesus. Walk away from the one so you can impact a dozen and see God work through you for the glory of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.